Hey, Warren, Charlie. Thank you again for having us and, and having me. Uh, I just can't thank you guys enough and appreciate you guys enough for the body of work that you guys have delivered to us and the uh, exemplar example that you guys have set with your principles. Thank you. Charlie, you mentioned that Charlie, you've mentioned that if given the chance, or the same chance with a smaller capital base, you would still look for mispriced stock opportunities. Of uh, course. <laughs> uh, and that would be determined through obviously what, what we call the, uh, the intrinsic value of the, or the, the company in question, an aggregate of the discounted future cash flows. Would you work the arithmetic using a fictional data set to illustrate the mathematical principia uh, to determine an intrinsic value um, and I'd hope you include the comprehensive metal, uh, mental model of the key metrics considered, any quali uh, qualitative assessments of the management, and any assumptions of its industry to determine the durability of its earning power. Uh, and Warren, uh, same, same to that effect, would you also demonstrate or illustrate a, uh, an arithmetic uh, problem set using with a significant capital base and provide the object lessons on how those have changed from a small to a large capital base? Well, I can't give you a formulaic approach because I don't use one. And I just mix all, I just mix all the factors and, and if the gap between value and, and price is not attractive, I go on to something else. And sometimes it's just quantitative, for instance, when Costco was selling at about 12 or 13 times earnings, I thought that was a ridiculously low value just because the competitive strength of the business was so great and it was so likely to keep doing better and better. But I can't reduce that to a formula for you. Uh, I like the cheap real estate, I like the competitive position, I liked the, the way the personnel system were, I, I liked everything about it and I thought, even though it's three times book or whatever it was then, uh, that it, it, it's worth more. But that's not a formula that anybody, if you want a formula, you should go back to graduate school. They'll, they'll give you lots of formulas that won't work. This is the longest we've ever gone in the Berkshire meeting without Charlie saying that getting to the point where he prefers Costco to Berkshire. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew? Okay, Warren, this question comes from a Berkshire shareholder who says they've been a shareholder for 10 years. I should say this may be one of the most pointed questions I've ever received for you. But you've so, elected to give it, though, anyway. <laughs> but, but I did. <laughs> the shareholder writes, I have watched the movie every year at this meeting when you testify in front of Congress on behalf of Solomon as the symbol of what it means to have a moral compass. Investors are increasingly looking to invest in companies that are socially and morally responsible. So I was disturbed when you were asked on CNBC about the role that business could play in sensible policies around the sales of guns. You said you didn't think business should have a role at all and you wouldn't impose your values on others. I was even more surprised when you said you'd be okay with Berkshire owning shares in gun manufacturers. At this meeting years ago, you said you wouldn't buy a tobacco company because of the social issues. The idea that Berkshire would associate with any company as long as it isn't illegal seems at odds with everything I think you stand for. Please tell us you misspoke. Well, uh, let's, let's explore that a little. Uh, should, it, should it be just my view or should it be the view of the owners of the company? So if I decide to poll the owners of the company, on a variety of political issues, and, and one of them being whether, you know, Berkshire Hathaway should support the NRA. You know, I know if a majority of the shareholders voted to do it, or if a majority of the board of directors voted to do it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that. I don't, I don't think that the, my political views, I don't think I put them in a blind trust at all when I take the job, and I, in the election of, 2016, I raised a lot of money. In my case, I raised it for Hillary, and I spoke out in various ways that were quite frank. But I don't think that I speak 
When I do that, I don't think I'm speaking for Berkshire. I'm speaking as a private citizen, and I don't think I have any business speaking for Berkshire. We have never, at the parent company level, we have never made a political contribution. You know, uh, I may go, and I don't, I don't go to our suppliers. I don't do anything of that sort where I raise money either for the school I went to or for a political candidate I went to or anything else. Uh, and I don't think that we should have a question uh, on the GEICO policyholder form. Are you an NRA member? You know, and if you are, you just aren't good enough for us or something. That, I think I, 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 do not, I, I do not believe in imposing my political opinions on the activities of our businesses. And if you get to what companies are pure and which ones aren't pure, I think it is very difficult to make that call. But, um, I think with that response, I'm almost afraid to call on Charlie, but go ahead, Charlie. <laughs> Well, obviously, you do draw a limit, Warren. Yeah, we all did. All kinds of things yeah. which are beneath us, even though they're legal. But we don't necessarily draw it perfectly because we've got some sort of supreme knowledge. We just do the best we can. And certainly, we're not going to ban all guns surrounded no. by wild turkeys in Omaha. Hi, good morning, Mr. Buffett and Ms. Munger. My name is Steffi Yu from Horizon Insights, a China-focused research firm based in Shanghai. Um, so I have a lot of mutual fund clients in China who are very young, relatively younger, and they manage a smaller portion of funds. So my question is, if you only have one billion dollars in your portfolio today, um, how would you change your investments? Would you consider more investment opportunities in uh, emerging markets such as China? Thank you. Yeah, I would. I would say if if I were working with a billion, I would probably find within a thirty trillion dollar market in the United States where I understood. Uh, things better just generally than I do around the world. I'd probably find find opportunities there that would be better, incidentally, by some margin than what we can find for hundreds of billions. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't. There's no way I'd rule out emerging markets. There was a time 15 years ago or so uh, when just because it was kind of interesting and it took me back to my youth. I uh, on a weekend, I went through a, a directory of Korean stocks, and I, I bought, and these were small stocks. Uh, well, they were small by the standards of, of either Korean or American business. They were big, big companies. But I found 15 or 20 and that were statistically cheap and bought some of each one myself. And, and there, are, there are opportunities with smaller amounts of money to do things that we just can't do. And, uh, uh, but I, my first inclination always would be to comb through uh, things in the United States. And, and, uh, but I'd comb through them in other countries. I probably wouldn't get into very, very small markets because uh, there can be a lot of difficulties even in market execution and taxation, a lot of things. You can find it, you can't find it in, you know, in America and China and Britain and a few other places. <laughs> You're probably not going to find it someplace else. So you may think you found it, but there may be, there may be a different game than you know. Uh, our problem is size, not geography. Charlie? Well, I already have more stocks in. China than you do as a percentage. So I'm with the young lady. <laughs> okay, well, you can, you want to name names? Do these stocks have names? Or? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Carol. Um, this question uh, and. I, I should just add one thing. You will find 
plenty of opportunities. And China, would, Charlie would say you've got a better hunting ground than even a person with similar capital in the United States. Would you agree with that? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and in a sense, there, it, it's logical that should be the case because it, it's a younger market, as well, but still a large market. So that that uh, markets probably work toward efficiency as they age. Japan had this very strange situation with warrants being priced out of line and all of that uh, 30 years ago. And it, people notice after a while it disappears, but there can be some very strange things happen in, in markets as they develop. I think you'd agree with that, Charlie, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Jonathan? Did I skip? I skipped Carol? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, this question, and I would concede it is not a small one, comes from Gideon Pollock of Montreal. He says, the world knows generally how the looks of Berkshire Hathaway have changed since you began to run the company in 1965. Berkshire was then a tiny northeastern textile company and now it is the number four company on the Fortune 500. What about the next 50 years? Could you give us your view of what Berkshire looks like in 2068? I think it'll look a long way away. <laughs> the, uh, no, the answer is I don't know, and I didn't know 50 years ago what it would look like now. I mean. It, it, uh, it will be based on certain principles, but where that leads, you know, it, we will find out and we'll have people that are thinking about different things than I am and we'll have a world that's different. And, but uh, uh, we will be, I very much hope and believe, and we will be, that we'll be as shareholder oriented as any large company in the world uh, we will look at our shareholders as partners, and and we will be trying to do with our money exactly what we do, would do with our own, not seeking to get an edge on them. And who else? Who knows what what else will be happening then? At, uh, Charlie. Well, I want to talk to the younger shareholders in the group, those of you who, after we are gone sell your Berkshire stock and do something else with it, helped by your many friends, I think you're going to do worse. <laughs> so I would advise you to keep the faith. Well, by the way, some of that has already happened in many families. <laughs> I'll give his answer next time now that I see it get all the applause. <laughs>